Yapulina, good evening and welcome to tonight's Island of Ideas event, Voice to Truth, Journey to the Referendum. My name is Greg Lehman, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Aboriginal Leadership here at the University of Tasmania and um, I'll be your um, very brief uh, MC for the night, you won't hear much from me. My job is simply to welcome you and I'd like to welcome you all here. Um, I'm hoping that the fact that you're here tonight means that many of you will already be aware that this is the, the lands of the traditional owners, the Muanina people, uh, who knew this place as Nipaluna. I'd like to acknowledge um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us this evening, in particular elders, and um, especially our students, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, our future leaders. It's my great pleasure now to introduce the convener of tonight's discussion, Professor Ian Anderson AO. Ian is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, academic, here at the University of Tasmania. He is a Palawa man, born in Devonport, and someone who is deeply connected to his traditional culture and community through his ties to Tebrakuna country in northeastern Tasmania. Ian has an unwavering dedication to preserving and honouring his heritage and his non-Aboriginal family are largely of convict descent from across La Truita, Tasmania. Ian has been a national policy leader in Indigenous affairs and also in higher education policy and programs. During his more than 20 years of working in higher education, he has promoted access to higher education for Indigenous Australians and for Australians from regional areas and educationally disadvantaged communities. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ian Anderson. Yapin Linga Karati. Hello and welcome, friends. Mina Ian Anderson, Waipa Parapinia, Chawalabe. Pamamara. Tapilche la Larapana Laramana Tana. Mina Tanapri Palawa Nini. Milatina Nika. Kunani Tintamali Manani Nipaluna. Mina Tanapri Palawa Waranta Takamuna. Milatina Tami Ninina Rachi. I introduce myself and where I'm from. I acknowledge with respect the old people of the country around where we are meeting, the mountain Kunanyi, the river Tintamali Mananyi, and Nipaluna are about. Palangina, Rodney Dillon, Waipa Pala, Palawa, Tuawalawe. Palangina, Marcy Langton, Yiman Bidjara. Takamuna, Rahala. Tani Rahala, Lenini Rahala. I welcome Palawa man, Rodney Dillon, and Yaman Bidjura woman, Marcy Langton. Both stand strong for their people, talk up strong for their people, and sing strong for their people. Nari Yenatu. Tonight's event is the second of three discussions hosted by the University of Tasmania exploring the upcoming National Voice to Parliament referendum. The Island Ideas series began in 2020 as a way to connect to our community here in Latvita and ideas while we we're unable to host face-to-face -face events. Sharing knowledge is the foundation of our university's culture. The Island Ideas program continues to broadcast these events across the world in the hope that we can connect the ideas and the people of Ratu Richa to a global network of collaborators and thinkers so that we can work together to create a better future. That is exactly why we're here tonight. In October 14, 2023, there will be a referendum for an Indigenous voice to Parliament to be enshrined in the Constitution. If a yes vote is received, the Australian Parliament can then legislate the voice to Parliament. 
The university recognises that the forthcoming referendum as the most important opportunity in 50 years to meaningfully address the national matters of representation, decision-making and justice for Indigenous people. As the, only, as the only university in Latakawitja, it is our civic duty to create a rich and productive community discussion on this subject, guarded by people who have been or will be impacted by the history of this conversation. We hope that you will join us in our venture this evening. Before inviting our panel to share their perspectives on how we reach this point, and where the campaign might lead over the coming weeks, I would like to share a very brief timeline showing some ways in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander bodies and leaders have fought to be heard. I begin with the original constitution uh, created by an act of British Parliament in 1901. There were two clauses in this constitution. Uh, they are called by constitutional lawyers the race clauses. The impact of these two clauses were profound. They did not allow or enable the new Commonwealth of Australia to pass laws or legislate for Indigenous Australians. They further had a clause that did not enable the Commonwealth of Australia, as it was created, to count Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the census. That had a profound impact is through counting on the census that the Commonwealth uh, allocated its resources to state governments. It was also counting on the, on the census that enabled a Commonwealth government to understand the impact on populations of health disadvantage and other forms of disadvantage. The Commonwealth of Australia, uh, working under that constitutional framework, uh, innovated globally to, in a very powerful way, to form social welfare legislation. Uh, children's, invalid pensions, old age pensions, unemployment benefits. These are all pieces of legislation that no Indigenous Australian could actually access. But in various ways, they were excluded from those forms of powerful forms of social welfare. In fact, it wasn't until um, 1959 that some of those, the, those uh, social welfare reforms enabled Indigenous Australians to access them for the first time in Australian history. And the final reforms occurred later in 1966-67 that removed all the discriminatory barriers to access for Indigenous Australians. At the same time, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were excluded from the franchise. Uh, in fact, ironically, uh, when the Australian constitution was set up, Aboriginal people were taken off the rolls in those progressive states of South Australia where they could vote. The first reform occurred post-World War II when returns, uh, Indigenous returned soldiers and servicemen were, became allowed to vote in the Commonwealth uh, uh, um, franchise for the first time. It was only until 1962 that the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people could vote, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people could vote in a Commonwealth election. And it was only until 1984 that the final barriers were removed and that Aboriginal people were traded as other Australians in the Commonwealth Electoral Act. In 1967, uh, a very powerful a moment in Australian history when all Australians voted to remove those two race clauses in the original constitution. Over 90% of Australians agreed, agreed that first Australians deserved equal constitutional rights. This enabled the Commonwealth to come pass laws for Aboriginal people and so the first Aboriginal programs only began in the post-67 environment. In the 1970s, the Whitlam government established the Department of Aboriginal Affairs under, with perforce to, in, to enable it to organise its policy and programme response uh, in Indigenous affairs. It was, this was the first separate department at a national level to get dedicated solely to Aboriginal affairs in Australia and was staffed 
uh, by uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and non-Indigenous Australians. This shift towards uh, self-determination and self-management was marked by the establishment of the National Aboriginal Consultative Committee, which was the first Australian uh, elected body to involve Aboriginal people. Its successor, the National Aboriginal Congress, uh, Conference, uh, some 50 years ago, passed a resolution requesting treaty between Aboriginal nations and Australian government, leaving, leading to the Makarata proposals that sought provision for matters including self-determination, compensation, rights to the land, protection of identity, language, law and culture. Fast forward until 1990, Yolngu Man, the great leader, Dr Yuna Pingu, uh, uh, provided the Hawke government with a bark petition. The response was the establishment of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, or ATSIC, which was the first Indigenous-led, Indigenous-managed uh, bureaucratic structure actually in the globe. Its remit was to provide First Nations with self-management and self-sufficiency and to maximise the participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in government policy. In 1990, the Aboriginal Provisional Government, uh, established by Aboriginal activists led by Michael Mansell, Jeff Clark, and Bob, Reverell, Bob, Bob Wetherill, also had a bold aim to campaign for Aboriginal sovereignty and the establishment of an Aboriginal nation state. It issued Aboriginal passports and birth certificates and set dim diplomatic delegations overseas. ATSIC, or the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, was abolished in 2004. It was abolished um, in a, by the Howard government, but it was Mark Latham in the election campaign in the year prior that opened up the door and said that he would ab uh, abolish the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission if he was elected to government. ATSIC had become significantly disconnected from the policy agenda of the Howard government, uh, particularly because the then chair of ATSIC, Jeff Clark, started a conversation about treaty. So a body set up to provide Aboriginal voice started to talk about treaty, and then 12 months later, it was no more. In 2007, uh, John Howard, in, the, in, the, in his final election campaign, uh, came back to the idea of constitutional reform. He called uh, that he, end, he he said that when if he was re-elected, uh, he would set up a constitutional reform panel that would create symbolic recognition in the Australian Constitution. Dr. Yuna Pingu, uh, in a lecture um, at the University of Melbourne in 2007, responded in kind, but he raised the aim. He said, symbolic constitutional reform will make no difference to my people. We need constitutional reform that strengthens Indigenous rights, constitutional reform that uh, provides a, a, a framework to wake up the Constitution, I think his phrase was, and enable us to actually find practical solutions to address Indigenous disadvantage. Every Australian government uh, since that time has had some process to further this conversation around constitutional reform. The Gillard government founded the expert panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the constitution. Their first report found strong public support for constitutional recognition and led uh, to uh, a process for interim recognition of Aboriginal people. The Referendum Council, established in 2013 to ensure Aboriginal decision-making is at the heart of the constitutional reform process. The Council met, met at Uluru to discuss their reform dialogues, where they drafted and endorsed the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The Uluru Statement of the Heart was, as they saw it, an invitation to Australian people from, from First Nations Australian. It asks Australians to walk together to provide a better future by establishing a First Nations voice of the parliament enshrined in the constitution, to establish Makarata Commission as for the purpose of treaty making and truth telling. In 2018, the Joint Select Committee of Parliament chaired 
by Senators pa Patrick Dodson and Julian Elisa found that the voice to be a viable recognition proposal and recommended the initiation of a co-design process for the voice between government and Indigenous Australians. In the year that followed, I led a team uh, then in the Department of Prime Minister of Cabinet and then in the National Indigenous Australians Agency to design that co-design process. Um, it was our view that this was the, the best way for us to show how a voice would work is to design it. And that process was led by Professor Marcia Langton and Professor Tom Karma that produced a report that went to 297 pages uh, and provided significant detail on both the proposals for regional voices uh, but also a national voice to the Parliament. Our first uh, speaker tonight co-chaired the senior advisor group that led this co-design process. Professor Marcia Langton AO is a uh, Yiman and Bedjara woman uh, from central and southwestern Queensland. She is an anthropologist, a public intellectual, an author and an Indigenous rights activist. She has served on various high-level committees on Indigenous issues. These included, um, amongst only a few, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. Uh, she has led Indigenous academic programs, such as the Centre for Indigenous Natural and Cultural Resource Management, and was a chair of the Indigenous Higher Education Council, and as a chair of the Yak Cape York Institute for Policy and Leadership. Since 2000, she has held the Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne, where she currently holds the posi position of Associate Provost. Please welcome Marcy Langton. Here in Utruita, uh, and uh, what a beautiful day it was in Nipulina. So thanks to the ancestors. Uh, and thank you to Ian, for outlining the many years of uh, campaigning we've observed. It's a real honour to follow uh, them as speakers and it's a great honour to be here with you uh, this evening. Um, I am very much uh, in favour of a yes vote for the um, referendum question. Uh, and I urge you to read the question and understand how simple and elegant it is. I want to say to you that the pamphlet that you may have received or will receive from the Australian Electoral Commission, which sets out the yes case and the no case, uh, is difficult for us to read. The yes case is entirely factual. Uh, the no case is substantially non-factual. Um, so I want to remind you of that and urge you uh, to have a look at some of the great resources that are available. Let me read to you the, uh, the foreword to the Voice Co-Design Final Report uh, which uh, Tom Kalmer and I uh, approved. Uh, but first of all, let me say that this report and its predecessor, our interim report, went to Morrison's cabinet, uh, the first in 2020 and then the second in 2021, both times the cabinet led by former Prime Minister Scott Morrison, in which the present opposition's leader, Peter Dutton, was present, released our reports unamended for con consultation uh, with the public, with the Australians. So we were led to believe that there was no problem with our reports. In fact, at the, in the last months of the Morrison government, the National Indigenous Australians Agency was 
beginning to implement the regional voices that we had recommended and uh, we were on the verge of establishing a committee to guide the establishment of those regional voices in up to 35 regions of Australia. Uh, so when people from the No campaign demand details, I wonder how it is possible that they could have forgotten that history, those incidents, those reports, not to mention many other reports that uh, preceded them and were concurrent with them. In any case, let me read you the foreword. Uh, and again, let me remind you that this report with its, this foreword emerged from the Scott Morrison Cabinet and was approved for public consultation. Across Australia, momentum is strong for an Indigenous voice to the Australian Parliament and Government. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples want a greater say on the laws, policies and programs that affect our lives and non-Indigenous Australians support that call. In this final report of the Indigenous Voice co-design groups, we present our proposal for realising this urgent solution to the ongoing predicament of Indigenous Australians with a robust and feasible means of improving outcomes. In October 2020, we presented the Indigenous Voice co-design process interim report to the Australian Government. Since the release in January 21 of proposals for an Indigenous Voice in the interim report, Australians from across the country have taken the opportunity to provide their feedback. Over 9,400 people and organisations participated in a consultation process led by co-design members. This marks one of the most significant engagements with the Australian community on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island affairs in recent history. Over four months, we had conversations with people and organisations across urban, regional and remote Australia. As a group, and there were 52 of us, we were fortunate to engage with people from 115 community consultation sessions in 67 diverse communities and more than 120 stakeholder meetings around the country. We also gathered feedback online with more than 4,000 submissions and survey responses put forward by both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous individuals, communities and their organisations. The feedback provided tremendous support for an Indigenous voice at the local and regional and national levels. The core proposals set out in the interim report were affirmed, demonstrating the value of co-design to achieve effective outcomes. The feedback also helped improve proposals with the national voice membership model changed to increase the focus on remote people and communities. We propose a strong, resilient and flexible system in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and our communities will be part of genuine shared decision-making with governments at the local and regional level and have our voices heard by the Australian Parliament and government in policy and lawmaking. A voice to the Australian Parliament and government would complement and amplify existing structures and would not replace the role for these structures to continue to work with government within their mandates. An Indigenous voice will provide the right mechanism working with and strengthening existing arrangements for the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to be heard on issues that affect us. The consideration of our vast experiences and diverse perspectives will lead to better policy outcomes, strengthen legislation and programs, and importantly, achieve better outcomes for our people. Now what lies before us could be the most significant reform in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs for generations. We heard in chorus from our own people, along with non-Indigenous Australians, how much it would mean 
for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to have our voices heard. The importance of what we propose cannot be understated. There was also strong feedback that an Indigenous voice must be secure and enduring and appropriately protected, while consideration of legal reform was outside our co-design responsibility, we were not surprised by the growing support for constitutional enshrinement that was particularly evident in submissions. We heard many practical and principled reasons supporting the enshrinement of an Indigenous voice in the Australian constitution, including that it would, <coughs> that it would be the best way to protect an Indigenous voice against abolition, enhance its effectiveness, and recognise the unique place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our nation. Security and longevity for an Indigenous voice were crucial elements of feedback received across the consultation process. The task for government is to consider how the Indigenous voice will be protected. As we deliver this final report, we are extremely proud of the efforts of the 52 co-design group members from across the country who worked in partnership <clears throat> over the past 18 months and through a global pandemic to develop these final proposals for an Indigenous voice. Together we listened, contested ideas and challenged ourselves to determine what might work best on each issue the co-design groups came to either a consensus or a clear majority view. The results of this rigorous process are now presented for the Australian government to consider in this report. It is very clear that an Indigenous voice is a necessary, pragmatic and natural step for our country as we work towards creating a better shared future for all Australians. We commend this final report to the Australian Government with optimism that the proposals will be taken forward. A commitment to implementing this proposal will see con conversation and co-design continue with communities across the country and involve governments or at all levels coming together and working with us in partnership. This would provide a strong and lasting voice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and be an historic step for our nation. I ask you to read the recommendations in our final report of the voice co-design. They're very important recommendations. And I also ask you to look at the close the gap statistics. I'll just give you a few. There is on average an eight year gap between the life expectancy of an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person and non-Indigenous Australians. While we are only 3% or thereabouts of the population, 25% of the prison population of Australia are Indigenous. Our children are removed from our families at an astonishing rate and many are not only in out of home care, but also in the juvenile justice system. In the Northern Territory, where the juvenile justice system was subjected to investigation by the Royal Commission into the Don Dale Juvenile Justice Detention Centre, 100% of the children in detention are Aboriginal. I could give you many more statistics. Many of us among the 52 people who served on this voice co-design process, chosen because of our experience and standing in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities or service to, were around in the days when the referendum in 1967 was held. We were around during the NACC, the National Aboriginal Consultative Committee, the National Aboriginal Conference that followed it, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission that followed it, and 
As we traveled around Australia during that four months to consult with people about our interim report recommendations, we each saw how much worse the conditions were becoming in our communities. Um, conditions that alarmed and frightened us. And so those of us who were involved in that voice co-design process affirm the findings of our report. Uh, there will be quibbles about a couple of points. We were not allowed to consider any constitutional issues, but as you heard, we received submissions on the need for constitutional enshrinement of a voice and we acknowledged those, even though that was outside of our, of our terms of reference. We have joined forces with all of those people who attended the National Indigenous Constitutional Convention at Uluru in 2017 and who unanimously voted for the Uluru Statement from the Heart because we all want the same thing. We want an end to the poverty and uh, trauma in our communities uh, that has resulted from uh, our substantial exclusion from government decision-making about matters that affect us. There is no possibility that we can close the gap anytime soon without involving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the decision-making processes in a robust way. I've probably spoken for too long, but there is something that I want to read to you because it speaks to this moment. I was, I think, <clears throat> uh, two years out from being able to vote when the 67 referendum was held, which as Ian explained, the majority of Australians supported. They supported removing two racist references from our constitution. The two more that remain can be addressed by the concept of the voice to parliament and the executive government. Because then if we succeed, there will be a mechanism for advice to ameliorate the capability of the Commonwealth Parliament and the executive government to make laws that cause us detriment, to make policies that cause us de detriment, or to make laws and policies that make our lives worse by not acting on our recommendations. If we can give that advice, that is the barest, most minimal human right we can ask for, and we are asking Australians to vote yes to give us that opportunity. In the year before the 1967 referendum, Kath Walker, as she was known then, she later changed her name to Ujuru Nunakal, uh, wrote a song of hope. I'll read it to you. Look up, my people. The dawn is breaking. The world is waking to a bright new day. When none defame us, no restriction tame us, nor colour shame us, nor sneer dismay. Now brood no more on the years behind you, the hope assigned you shall a past replace. When a juster justice grown wise and stronger points the bone no longer at a darker race. So long we waited, bound and frustrated, till hate be hated and cast opposed. Now light shall guide us, no goal denied us. And all doors open that long were closed. See plain the promise, dark freedom lover. Night's nearly over. 
And through, and though the long climb, new rights will greet us, new mateship meet us, and joy complete us in our new dream time. To our fathers' fathers, the pain, the sorrow. To our children's children, the glad tomorrow. Vote yes. Uh, thank you, Marcia. And thank you for reminding us of one very powerful woman whose conviction actually changed our world. Uh, Mujuru Nunako was a poetic visionary, and I'm so glad you read that poem. It always makes me cry. So our final speaker is Pao Palawa Man, what New Zealand, so a Wailaway Man, a lifelong advocate for the rights of Indigenous peoples. He is the Indigenous Rights Advisor for Amnesty International Australia, Chairperson of the Aboriginal Heritage Council and former, formerly the Tasmanian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, Commissioner. He established the Tasmanian Regional Aboriginal Communities Alliance to provide a mechanism to engage and advise government at all levels regarding affairs affecting the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Tasmania. Rodney is a widely respected elder who has campaigned for decades for the recognition of cultural rights to gather traditional foods and still dives regularly for abalone and scallops to feed his family and community. He recently negotiated the first allocation of abalone quotas for Aboriginal people. Rodney also led the successful campaign to acquire Murrayfield pastoral property on Rubruni Island for the Wetapana Aboriginal Corporation, providing an economic base for Aboriginal community development. Please welcome Rodney. It's very hard to follow Marsha, let me tell you. But thinking about introducing something new to the oldest race in the world, to think about our people. Just last night we had a full moon and our people have been around for 700,000 full moons. <laughs> to think about being invisible, and I felt very invisible in this state at different times. But at the moment, I feel very proud and very privileged because I think it's one of the first times I've seen in Tasmania where we've had the Greens, the Labor and the Liberal all agree that the yes vote is important. And the, the reason that Tasmania is one of the leading states in this country is because our people care. Our people care for other people. And we've done many things that's been the first here in Tasmania, and there's a list of them not like Marsha's list, I haven't got them written down, so I can't tell you. But uh, the uh, thinking, about, thinking about the importance of having us being able to say to the government, could you try this? To give a government just some advice on how to treat our people. That's all we're asking is to, can we get, give them some advice to make change, to make it better? I see, I travel a lot interstate and I travel in communities that's less afforded than us. I go to Docker River, I go to Utopia, I go to Yundamu. And when a person comes out of hospital in Alice Springs who've had their leg amputated because of sugar diabetes, They've got nowhere to go. They haven't got a house to go to. They can go back to the community or they can long grass it either in Darwin or in Alice Springs and they'll be hassled for long grassing. And I just find it very difficult as a country that we can do that to old people and young people. And for us, I think for the people that's on the Yes campaign, Everything we talk about is evidence-based 
and our people are very honest. And then I think about the people that's on the no campaign and I have a look at their background who's come before us. When they say no, I'd like them to look that old fella or that old lady in the eye and say, we'll do something later for you. Those people haven't got time to wait. We need to make change now. We've got an Australian government, a good government that wants to make change today, and that's why I'm back in this government, and that's why I'm on the Yes campaign. I want to be able to help them old people back to their community and back to, to full strength as they can from where they've come from. I see these steps as important, and I don't want to look those people in the eye and say, no, because that, I think, would be the lowest form of thing that I could do. And I come from better standards than that, I can tell you. And I see some of the people standards that are against this, they send chills through my body and through my bones and through my ancestors. My two and a half thousand generations of my ancestors, it's in the ground before me. I represent them people every day. And I fear that if the, this doesn't go as good as it should do, that those old people will be aching. They'll be aching in the ground for what's happened here. I think we've got an important time in this country to make change. This is the only time in my lifetime we'll have that change to be made. That's going to be made within the next six weeks. That vote is going to be so important for our people to go forward. We talk about welcome people onto our land. We talk about lots of many things. We think about when the New Zealanders come here and they put their hand out of friendship when they all sing the same song, we don't have that same song here. I think this is the greatest opportunity we've got for us all to sing that same song. I feel that the time is now for us to make that change and I'm, that's why I'm supporting this change to come sooner rather than later. So I can tell them people that haven't got a house that's living in 47 degrees heat because of climate change. The climate change that us in this room have made together We've all made these changes and we need to make better decisions. And this by voting yes is that better decision. Thank you. I wanted to acknowledge that we couldn't be joined by Michael Mansell tonight, uh, who's been a powerful activist. I reminded Michael of the impact he had on the Close the Gap uh, negotiations in Canberra in 2018, when he said in the National Cabinet Room, uh, that the National Cabinet, uh, then the Co Council of Australian Governments, absolutely had to recognise incarceration. After he left that room, then Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, said to me, turned to the room and said, I have never agreed with Michael Mansell so much in my life. And that enabled me to then have a process where we now have a close the gap target, which Marcia quoted is appalling, uh, in, the, in the close the gap negotiation against everything that state governments wanted to do at the time. So I, I want to publicly acknowledge the power of, of his voice at that moment. So, um, and he's unwell tonight, so I want to wish him well and his family. So I think um, what we're going to do now is that we're going to take your questions. Um, I'm going to take the prerogative of asking the first question. So Marcia and I asked Rodney the same question. In 2004, when the Howard government abolished the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission because uh, Jeff Clark started to talk about treaty, what was going through your mind at that moment? Or over those moments? So it was very clear to me uh, that uh, uh, Prime Minister John Howard and his advisers at that time were confecting a culture war and uh, you know, accusing uh, members of the National Commission of being corrupt um, and, and that it was a sustained attack over more than 18 months from memory. Um, but you might note 
uh, that nobody was charged and there were no convictions. Uh, indeed, uh, I, during that term of, of those commissioners, I served on the Section 13 commissions established by ATSEC uh, to propose a treaty, uh, a pathway to treaty, and uh, we produced a, a report. Uh, and you will also remember that Prime Minister John Howard was uh, opposed to treaties with Indigenous people, and he said it again yesterday that uh, it's not possible to have uh, treaties with Indigenous people because treaties are between sovereign nations. And, uh, you know, of course, he's quite wrong um, uh, about that. There are all kinds of treaties. There are treaties with Indigenous people in Canada, New Zealand, uh, the United States of America, and have been since the 1830s, at least. Um, and uh, there is a treaty uh, process in Victoria, one in uh, the Northern Territory and also in Queensland and uh, learned legal scholars uh, say that the Noongar settlement is a modern treaty. Uh, I know that, that that was the reason for the closure of ATSIC. ATSIC was working very well and indeed their last major piece of work at that time was a housing audit because the evidence was coming in of the overcrowding. And then, of course, overcrowding has been identified as the major uh, social determinant of poor health. Uh, it underlies, you know, the uh, neglect of children, which then How How Howard and his advisors uh, exploited uh, around the debate of the little children, a sacred report and used as a justification for sending the armed forces into the Northern Territory and legislating 500 pages of the Northern Territory Emergency Intervention Act, which suspended the Racial Discrimination Act entirely uh, for a number of uh, measures. So those are my recollections. So, <laughs> so Rodney, um you were, you was, you were a Nazi commissioner, and you're involved in the treaty process here on the island. What were your rec recollections in 2004? Once again, it's a little bit hard to go. Could you put me in front of Marsha instead of behind her? <laughs> I'm starting to get sick of this. The, the, I think that I was in ATSIC at the time, and we was making policies about water as well as, um, as as on housing, housing of overcrowding and was looking at, was getting uh, reports back of how much overcrowding and the quality of it, how many houses was habitable and how many that wasn't habitable at that stage. How many houses had water, how many houses had sewerage and how many house had, houses had power. And it was very alarming, especially uh, around the centre of Australia and that's the whole centre more so than the, than the outside coastal towns. So there was a lot in it at that time, and we all became we all became instant criminals as ATSI commissioners. We was all labelled as criminals. You couldn't get when ATSI closed down. You couldn't get a job, and we was all labelled that we was all thieves and thugs. And I think that it was a very hard time at that time for for a lot of Aboriginal people. And in that time, when you have that vortex of that, that we don't need a representative body, we don't need anything because the government will look after you, trust me. And that's some of the very problems that we had. They had, when you talked about the Northern Territory intervention I, and the, the Little Children's Sacred report, then out of that came uh, the basics card. So I was just thinking about the basics card. So if there's one person in each group in this room tonight that couldn't look after their money or, or had money problems. So in, with the basics card, so we're going to give you all a basics card, the whole lot of you. You all need one. Every one of you need one. And it's because you are in this group. You're in a group of people. You're Aboriginal people tonight. So that was one of the major things that I've seen in this in this country that that shamed me 
uh, and that vortex of not having anyone that could stand up. When, that, when they brought that basics card in, there wasn't a group that could stand up. So I see the importance of a representative body not being there to give the government better advice than what it was getting off the people that was making these decisions. The people that was making these decisions was making very poor decisions about our people and it caused misery. I, I was in Utopia at the time at, at uh, Mosquito Ball and I brought a family out from there to, to Alice Springs to do their shopping. A, a husband, two children and the mother. And we, the husband wouldn't go into the shop because all Aboriginal men from the Torres Strait, uh, from Northern Territory were seen as paedophiles at that time. The mother and the two kids and I goes into the shop. She's got a basics card. She filled it up with her groceries like we would all do at, at either the local stores that we go to. And a young girl at the, at the counter when we come out picked out all the things that she couldn't have in that, in that trolley. And here's this woman with two children. And I just felt very, very sad and... But, yeah, more yeah, angry, more than angry. And I had to drive them back about another two and a half hours and try and support them on the way home. And it was a it was an awful feeling at that time to do that. So I've seen these things, the basics cards, I've seen the intervention where nothing happened. I see all these things that they put in place when we wasn't there. And that's why I think that we need people to give government advice because they have not been able to do that job. And if they had been able to do the job, I'd be happy to work with them, but they haven't been able to. And if we have a look at closing the gap, the quotes that Marsha gave us, all those statistics that we've got are all backwards. And that's because they have not bothered. Because people from Canberra, they talk about these um, Aboriginal people being Canberrians. The people from Canberra, the ones that's been making the decisions for people they've never known or never seen or never likely to ever have any contact with. But they can make these decisions from Canberra that's going to affect these families for generations. And, I, and I, I, that's why I think that we need ones that can affect it from our side for generations. And that's why I say it's important. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Abby. Firstly, just want to say Scrooge on Howard. Um, Secondly, I have a question about um, does the government, if the voice gets passed, is there, does the government legally have to listen to the advisory body? Can they listen and then say, well, whatever, cool? Do they have to take it into account? Are there frameworks that will legally make it legitimate? So... so I, I'm not going to say who should go first. I think they can. I think they can fight it out. Uh, the uh, should we be successful, um, the government uh, would not be required to take the advice of of the voice. The voice would be uh, entirely designed and legislated by the parliament of the day. Um, let's have a think about how that might occur, although no details have been announced. I guess they're going to wait until after we see the referendum results. But uh, let's say we're successful. Um, I imagine that there would be a, a parliamentary committee uh, that would take submissions, uh, much as, you know, the parliament does on most major policy questions. And then it would draft legislation, the legislation um, would be uh, subjected to further inquiry. Uh, it would uh, be tabled in the House of Representatives, debated there. If it succeeds in the House of Representatives, it would go to the Senate where it would be debated. It might be sent off to another committee. Uh, and uh, if it were passed by the Senate, then it would become law. The parliament at any time would be able to amend that legislation. Um, but it's very clear uh, from all the principles of our democracy, the Westminster system, uh, uh, especially because of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty uh, and, and the very definition of, of the voice in the question, um, uh, the, the, that the voice would be advisory only. Of course, it would have no veto. 
Um, the government uh, does not have to take its advice, neither the parliament nor the executive government. So the, I, I can probably add, because I've read the co-design report, there are a couple of mechanisms that are very powerful. The first is that advice has to be transparent. So any advice that the government doesn't take, they have to pay the politics. Yeah? The second thing is that the voice, if they follow the co-design report, can provide advice on any matter pertaining to Indigenous Australia, whether or not they, they want to hear it. And the third thing is it's constitutionally enshrined, so it can't be abolished just because their voice is not liked. So it is, it is a form of self-determination. Uh, it has its drawbacks and it can't be seen in isolation to treaty making and truth telling because all those things together actually are empowering. Uh, but there are some mechanisms in the co-design report, if the government takes it on, that actually make it transparent and make it hard for government to wriggle and pretend they didn't hear it or pretend that the report never landed or pretend that indeed they didn't want to know. And the other thing that probably is probably a little bit not so obvious, it's a voice to the government and to the parliament. So it's, a vo it's also a voice to provide an opposition with the tools to actually hold a government to account. So there are a number of ways in which this is much more than a consultative mechanism. This is, not, this is more powerful than the ATSIC was in some ways. So uh, we'll go to um, a question uh, from an online participant, um, and this is from Kevin O'Day. And it's an important question, I think, because it's something that causes uh, concern and, and perhaps confusion uh, for many people. The question is, why are a number of Indigenous people, such as Jacinta Price, opposed to the idea of the voice? I got to go first for this one. <laughs> Jacinta. Thank you. I think, I think that the um, people are allowed to oppose things in this country and I think that they make their comments. I really worry about the evidence they use against the voice. The evidence that they're using against the voice to me is made up evidence. It's not evidence based. And I think that we shoot holes in their stories every time. It worries me that they can convince so many Australians that they've got on their side with this. It's like a, it's like a travelling circus, isn't it? You see it going around promoting this. So I think that they can have their say, um, and it's important for them to have their say. But I, I would wonder in my life when me and Pauline Hanson and Peter Dutton had something in common. Just on that, like I said before, when people are saying no, don't say no to me, go to the hospital and have a look at those people that's just had their, their um, legs amputated or the people that's, that's not got a home. Go and tell them that it's okay for another couple of years to go and you just go and live long grass. You don't need a home. You don't need you don't need all these things. And when we go home tonight and open the door, think how lucky we are that we have that home. I think that understanding these people that haven't got one is bloody hard. And I find it very difficult um, working in those places with that when people haven't got houses and they're sick and they've got nowhere to go and then the houses are loaded up. Uh, thank you. We've got another question from I, I can barely see that far. Okay, my name is Gail. Um, I'd like to actually respond to that um, comment there. I am not Aboriginal but, or Indigenous, but I don't have a home either over this last pandemic, so I don't have a home to go to. Um, so it's not just Indigenous Australians that have suffered over these last three years. Um, I barely was able to get a job because of the mandates. So it's not just about, um, there are a lot of people in Australia at this current time that have similar um, conditions and they can't get hospital um, help or 
in, in those kind of things. So that's just a comment from there. What I'd like to ask is about um, the National Indigenous Australians Agency. Um, I'd like to know the actual details of what their, um, their policies are. So they actually are, there's about 13 to 1400 people in there. They have a quite a large um, monetary um, budget and there is uh, things like uh, 636 million over six years to expand Indigenous ranges programs, 37.5 million strengthening governance of prescribed bodies corporate, creating a direct forum for native title holders to work with government on reforms, looking at ways to uh, come together in regional groups and share skills and services, 21.9 million mentoring package, expansion of the Australian Indigenous mentoring experience, funding for the Office of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporation to develop governance, training materials and provision of scholarships. 1.9 million will extend custody notification services in WA and Northern Territory by one year and fund an evaluation of the CNS. 98 million support community development program providers. Well, what I'm saying is, the question is, there are um, the N... IAA is an agency that has um, a voice to parliament. It has, um, and it also has uh, a voice to the executive. So why is there a need to actually have a voice in the constitution when um, all Aboriginals now, I understand that they didn't have the right to vote and things like that, but they are recognised under the Australian um constitution so they all have a vote, the same as every other Australian? That's a great question. So I might attempt to answer part of it. The challenge is, is that the NIAA works for the Australian government. It doesn't have an alternative perspective. It has to do what the government asks it. When I was, I led the, the Close the Gap negotiations, I was a Deputy Secretary in the NIAA and also in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. The problem was that those negotiations was the Commonwealth Government talking to state governments. And then at a particular point of the, of the negotiation, the Australian Government and the state governments decided that they needed some on-the-ground perspective to actually influence those negotiations. And so they invited the coalition of Aboriginal peak organisations which spoke for people on the ground, not from government, from on the ground. That profoundly changed the nature of those negotiations. It meant that we actually had a broader suite of targets on the table. It also provided what I thought, we, and we couldn't have done this from government, we needed community partners at the decision-making table to tell us that we also needed to address uh, structural reform. We needed to improve the quality of access to health services and other services. We needed to address structural racism in the system. We needed to provide better data to communities to inform decisions. And we also needed to uh, drive that kind of reform agenda. So the, the agreement we got was far better than I could have gotten just listening to my government. It was far better than we would have got from just state governments. So the thing is that with the NIAA, it's a tool of government. It has to, it's a, pub, it's a public service agency. It has to represent the views of the government. And what this proposal for a voice provides is another mechanism that holds government to account. And the thing that was absolutely powerful about having the coalition of Aboriginal peak organisations, so 50 organisations, who had on the ground experience in delivering education, healthcare, all that, is that it held governments to account in a way public servants can't. Uh, sorry, we've got one other question, I think. I'm Kate Warner. Marcia, I have a question for you, and it really arises out of the talk you gave this afternoon at Lawfest. And one of the um, students asked a question, and you gave such a great response to it. 
I'd like to ask that student's question again. And the question was, why is it, um, what is your response when people say, we don't need a voice to parliament because we have Aboriginal members of parliament? Why isn't that sufficient voice? And you gave a great response. So can I re-ask that question, please? Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. It's, it's, I'm glad you asked me that question. But just to go back to the previous question, let me be very clear. Uh, the National Indigenous Australians Agency is the Australian government. It is a part of the Australian government. It's uh, staffed entirely by public servants, most of whom are non-Indigenous. What percentage of people in the agency are Indigenous? Ian? Uh, about 20% are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. About 20% are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, but they are public servants. The agency is a part of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Yes. And it is uh, it reports to the Minister for Indigenous Affairs and the Prime Minister through the Prime Minister's office. Um, and uh, I just want to say this from the point point of view of my many years in, uh, as an outsider to the system, um, the government system, uh, we Indigenous people want an audit of all that funding. You've cited a few figures. I, I hugely support some of those programs and thank goodness they're funded. They do make our lives better and there are a few others that do. But there's an enormous amount of waste now, the No campaign thinks that they've invented, you know, something new. Uh, no, they haven't. We have been saying for 50 years that there's government waste and the money's going to the wrong places and you need to take our advice so that there's no replication on the ground and that the money goes to the right programs that are designed, and we would say now, co-designed with us. Um, I'll remind you of uh, one minister, uh, Senator Nigel Scullion. Um, as he uh, was entering, say, the last year of his uh, role as Minister for Indigenous Affairs, he must have pushed out the door at least a half a billion dollars, and most of it went to non-Indigenous entities. Is that correct, Ian? Um, because I was a public servant at the time, I can't actually say. Okay. No, it's absolutely true. Uh, bl got, blink, tw respect... blink twice if you hear me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, it probably was more than that, Marcia. More than that. Okay, so I, can re I remember, I haven't got the details here, but he funded the uh, Cattlemen's Association of the Northern Territory the Commercial Fishermen's Association of the Northern Territory, um, the uh, various church bodies, church trusts, football clubs, West Farmers, West Farmers. Um, I put a major program in the hands of the Royal Flogging Doctor Service, which should have been in the hands of an Aboriginal community controlled medical service. It's one of the reasons for the health conditions becoming so much worse. I could go on and on. Um, look, so now we know it was well over half a billion dollars. I, I tried to track it. It was, it just made us weep. Uh, and you know, they call it the cash and splash. So you come to the end of a financial year in government, they haven't spent all their money. So remember, these are fake figures. They tell you in the budget papers that the money's been allocated. The question is, has it been spent? Talk to the people who. Uh, alleged to have received funding if they're flood victims or fire victims. Most of them are still living in dire straits, so you must know what I'm talking about. Look, I could go on and on. We want an audit too. Uh, the question about the Aboriginal representatives in Parliament. All of them in the federal Parliament represent political parties. They're in political parties and they follow their party policies and their party rules. All of them are bound by the laws of Australia. They are there as the elected candidates of electorates, 
not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but electorates, which in most cases are majority uh, uh, non-Indigenous. They, are, they represent their electorates. They don't re represent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander interests. And I've seen over many years that with the best of intentions, they go into parliament, but there they are stuck in a party where they have to actually vote against our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander interests. This is a question from an anonymous um, participant. Um, but again, an, another important question, I think, that, that we come across in public debate quite often. What does the amendment mean when it says issues relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island matters? Does, does, this, does this equate to issues relating to anything and everything, given that Aboriginal people are full participants in Australian society? When we talk about things that Aboriginal matters, we talk about the things that affect our people. And the things that affect our people, like we're talking about in The Voice, is health, housing, education, employment. So all these things, and it's not where they're going to park the nuclear submarines, like some of the questions that's been asked. So it's, it's more about the things that, that uh, are going to affect our people, the, th the long-term effect on our people, the, the health, the long-term effects of health. We didn't get to be living eight to ten years less than anyone else in the last fortnight. These things have been going on for a long time. So the things that affect our people, and it could be education in a remote community or it could be employment, it, it could be health, um, food, it could be all those things that's related to us. So there's many things that's related to Aboriginal communities that we want to make better. This is not about a negative, this is about how we make it better. So these are the things that's going to assist to make our lives better in those communities. Hi, it's Kirsten here from Reconciliation Tasmania. Thank you all for speaking tonight. We really appreciate you all, especially Marcia, coming down. I'm a northerner, I'm from Lonnie, and my question is, when are you going up north, northwest, northeast to talk? Because that's where, if you want to get Tassie over the line, I'm a Lonnie girl, I know the people there. I was at Agfest for work. I spoke for half an hour to a farmer. He's worried his farm's going to get taken. This is the northwest, the northeast. The northwest is a stronghold that we really need to hit. So this is probably more a question for the Yes campaign, but it's really important and it's really worrying a lot of us who are working in the space at the moment. Look, I think that that you're very true of what you've said, and we've only got a, you know a short amount of time now to do that in those areas. It's also New Norfolk, the west coast as well. Those places, all we need to get people into those areas to talk about this. We've got Bridget Archer talking good in the northeast, but we need, and, and there's, this afternoon, I think they was talking, um, was the Prime Minister in the northwest this afternoon? I think he was. Um, so we've got people talking up there in the north at the moment, but we need to have people constantly doing it. And I agree with you, yes, getting enough people to do it. Rodney, I know you from old, you're a tough old guy and you still are. My question is, when you look at the Uluru Statement from the heart, and then you look at the voice, is what is suggested in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. They want a non-advisory body as a Uluru Statement from the Heart. They also want a black constitution. And if it need be, a percentage of GDP in Australia, which presently stands at about $2.7 trillion. Yeah. Look, I think that what we're asking for is not very much but but if we ask for too much do we you know that that old saying you eat an elephant one mouthful at the time i think this is what we're trying to do we're trying to be as conservative as possible to get this over the line we can see how hard it is uh, and i agree i totally agree with you i've been fighting for a little while and we are battled scarred but i think that what we're asking for is the most minimal thing we can to make this significant change. And I think that's where we're up to. And it's a bit like shooting fish in a bowl here tonight, but when we get out in, in the wider community, it's, it's a lot harder. So I think we start off at a small stake and we, we build it up over a period of time and getting the Australian people to, to feel 
comfortable and then take the next step. And that's what we're trying to do with this country, to mature it and to take those steps. But as a non-advisory body to Parliament, how is it going to be affected? The legislation will follow, as everybody says here, and there's some good legal minds in this room tonight. But every government that follows can change that legislation with a stroke of a pen. I'll give you an example of, of the one time recently when we've been effective in giving advice. It was in uh, COVID, right? The beginning of COVID, when we started to see COVID as it left um, China and, and landed, I think, first in Italy, in Northern Italy. Um, uh, those of us in the health sector thought, and this was before the World Health Organization declared it a pandemic, we thought, holy dooly, here comes a pandemic. Uh, we, we saw television reports of how patients, well, uh, uh, how people who'd caught COVID-19 were responding. They were dropping dead in the street. You remember that time? Uh, our health sector had dealt with epidemics in the past. What was that uh, flu in Central Australia that knocked off so many people? I've got to be quick. We, uh, we, we pulled our, everybody together we, for, before anybody else, before the rest of the medical sector. We got a national task force of, of Aboriginal experts uh, and, and we, we closed Aboriginal borders, we protected our old people, uh, and we put in place public health messaging, pub, public hygiene rules, and we, I think we had zero deaths in the year before vaccines became available in our community, and it was the first time in our history that we'd reverse the gap. We dramatically reversed the gap. It seems to me that for 235 years, white fellas have been doing stuff to black fellas, often full of good intent, but we failed. You can look at any parameter you like, and there have been lots of them talked about tonight. We poured billions and billions of dollars into it, and yet if we don't change it, why would we think anything different is going to happen? Now, to quote Fred Cheney, We've got to stop us white fellas. We've got to stop doing stuff to black fellas and do stuff with them. Now, if we're going to do stuff with black fellas, we've got to listen to them and we've got to hear them. But if they have no voice, then how can we hear them? So we must vote yes. I think that's probably a good summary for us to finish on. Uh, Bill? I just realised who it was. So I'm going to invite um, Professor Black to offer us a vote of thanks as he comes up. I just want to really kind of, I, I, can't, I can't capture that conversation, but we talked through some of the challenges in how our voice can be effective, how that sort of advice can be anchored and enshrined in the Constitution about the need to really think for if the, if the vote is yes, there is a further com conversation and process to actually get good legislation, good legislation in front of the parliament. We talked about the need to ensure that the voice is not the entire solution, that treaty and truth telling as, as was envisaged in the Uluru uh, Statement from the Heart is part of that solution. And I think that I just want to um, finish and say, uh, thank you to Greg. Uh, thank you to Rodney. I'll go Rodney first because I don't want to. I don't want to get in any more any more trouble than I'm already in. And also to thank Marcia Langton. But I'm going to now hand over to Professor Black to really provide the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Ian. And it's a privilege on a night like tonight to offer a vote of thanks. And I do so with two hats. I do so as the Vice Chancellor of the University. And with that thanks, it's thanks for contributing to our role on this island as being a place where we can help inform uh, the conversations and discussions and deliberations uh, that are needed in order for Australia to make a choice and in order for Tasmania to play a choice. We have a role to create a space for conversations like tonight, where all views can be heard, discussed, respectfully questions answered uh, and responses given. 
So as a Vice Chancellor, I thank you for, in such a dignified and powerful way, providing us with that opportunity. But I also say thank you as a person in my role, just as Rufus Black, uh, one vote, one citizen person. And to thank you for offering, as a non-Indigenous Australian, a pathway to reconciliation. A pathway that I don't take for granted. I recognise that reconciliation in any nation is a very rare gift. It doesn't come because it's required, it comes out of extraordinary generosity to take all of the injustices of the past, the criminal takeover of the country, the invasion, the genocides, the murders, to put those things to one side and offer non-Indigenous Australians a chance to build a relationship and a nation together. It is only a small number of countries in the world that have ever had a population ready to offer a pathway to reconciliation when everywhere else it would be a pathway of justice. You offer us this gracious pathway to find a way forward. I don't take that for granted, but I recognise we are at a moment of choice in the nation where that is a point where we may not, that pathway may not be open indefinitely. That if we as white and uh, non-Indigenous Australians don't recognise that, we may lose the one opportunity, a historic moment in the life of a nation to actually build a common future built on an extraordinary gracious gesture of people who had no reason to offer it. And when I look at the history of Marcia, of Tom, uh, of all of the people who played national roles, of Rodney, of Ian, uh, of Greg, we are fortunate at this moment to have these people as leaders. Nations rarely get gifts like this. Various nations have been founded by great people and we have effectively an opportunity for a second foundation of our nation. Possible, possible because of this graciousness. It would be deeply unwise for us to squander it because it's hard to know what an alternative pathway looks like. It won't be this one. And the opportunity is given to us because the Uluru Statement, which is a statement I think more uh, dignified than our own constitution, and I think in time, if this goes right, will be a founding document of the country. One of those documents that people look to in hundreds of years' time to say, on what was this nation founded? It could well be the Uluru Statement because it offers us a pathway, a different pathway as a nation to become a different country. If that's the case, then we have, that's the offer. The Uluru Statement offers us the pathway. It invites us to walk together. It's an offer, offer to us as white people, as non-Indigenous Australians to walk together. And we have to do that walking together. And tonight, obviously, there's strong support in the room for The Voice. But I think we're at a moment where we've got to have a conversation with everybody we know, and especially the people who think no, to be able to offer and remind them as non-Indigenous Australians that this is a chance for us, as much as it is for Indigenous Australians, to build the kind of country we want together. And if we squander this chance to build together, it may not be an opportunity in any of our lifetimes that we see again, and we may never see again in the history of the nation. So I invite everyone, as we offer our vote of thanks tonight, to take it as a call to have all of those conversations over the coming weeks until this critical date. So tonight I say thank you, and I will be voting yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rufus. And uh, thank you to all of you who have brought your observations, your questions um, here in a respectful, critical, but respectful and dignified manner. Um, the same can't be said for some of the online questions that we had. We have received um, a measure of uh, abusive input and insulting input. Unfortunately, this is one of the byproducts of uh, of the the public debate that we're experiencing and enduring at the moment. And I'd just uh, like to ask all of you who have Aboriginal um, colleagues and friends and family members um, to look out for them um, because uh, the quality of the public debate at the moment um, is a burden that, um, that we're having to bear. And uh, I'd like to think that the, um, the generosity and goodwill and care and kindness that's been um, brought together tonight by you all um, uh, is an indication of how we can we can do better in that public debate. Once again, thank you to all of you for taking part 
in this special event this evening on behalf of the University and Island of Ideas team. Have a happy and safe evening. Good night.